space cats that fight space dragons? Is that what we're talking about here? So they're like, here's the plan. We're going to make like a sidecar spaceship that's like the size of a football, <laughs> complete with a psychic helmet, and boom. Now you can mind meld with your own personal cat who has its own mini light bombs that it can fire at the dragons. <laughs> Everybody and welcome to 500 Open Tabs. I'm Kava Taharian. And I'm Hannah Hillam. Welcome back. Welcome back to the show. Last week we had a lot of fun learning about uh, Cord, what did you call him? Cord Wiener? Cord Wiener. <laughs> Cord Wiener Smith. Uh, Hannah had a bit of a, uh, ex- not a bad crisis, no, but, but just like sort of a- like a mind melting thing about like her grandfather also. Why, why don't you tell them yeah. about it? Yeah. So if you didn't listen to the last so week, to last week uh, cover, which you should go do because this is a two parter. Yes. So stop That's right true. now and go listen to it. If yeah. you freaking you fool. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I love <laughs> I love everybody who listens. I, I'm sorry. I was I was just I was ref- what is it called? Reflecting? No. Reflecting back. Yeah. Uh, projecting. projecting. I, don't know. I was projecting. So yeah, we were. I was listening to tell me about this Cord Wainer Smith guy, who Cord Wainer. Yeah. Uh, but he was Cord he was also like. It, like, like essential in creating the psychological warfare like text literally wrote the book on literally it literally wrote yeah. the book that like the CIA the army and all over the world end up you ended up using and uh yeah. something about what he was saying struck me as familiar and um cuz you like to engage in psychological warfare I do, often as you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's how I got you to do this podcast with me yeah i'm the one thanks, who controls moms. this thanks moms <laughs> you're not listening <laughs> I hope. <laughs> so I'm sorry. I'm kidding, Mom. We're joking. We're joking. Um, yeah, so my grandpa was actually, when he was went to Korea for the Korean War, when he was like 20-something, he got put mm-hmm. into the psychological warfare department uh, unit Crazy. in Korea at the same time yeah. that Cord Wainer Smith was there. So Who, uh, just to be clear, uh, his real name, so that oh, was yeah. his pen name. His real name is Par- Paul... I think I, I pronounced it Linebarger last week. It might be Linebarger. I'm not Barger. sure. If it's German, I don't think it's J. It's like the G sound. Linebarger. I say as but if anyway, I Paul speak German. <laughs> you do. I mean, with that, you sound authoritative, Great. so I'm going to listen to you. Just, but just Paul, like my German Paul Linebarger ancestors. was the one. Authoritative, anyway. <laughs> he was the one that was uh, serving in the military at he that time. He was serving in the military. Thing. He'd already written yeah. the book. So I, mm-hmm. of course, went on this gigantic deep dive instead of doing everything else I had to do. Because I had to figure it out. I was like, were they there at the same time? Did they know each other? Mm-hmm. And so I dove mm-hmm. into my grandpa's like book he wrote. I went, searched all of his papers online. And I did find that they were both cited in a in a an Asian studies. That's so cool. Journal. And that yeah. most of my, like my grandpa, his name, Hillam, was alongside mm-hmm. Linebarger's name several times. Mm-hmm. Uh, That's so cool. But I did some matching of like dates and how old each of them were and my yeah. grandpa landed in Korea in 1952, and that was when Leinberger was there. But he was yeah. in Korea, and my grandpa got there, and they sent him to Japan to work in the, oh. the Japanese sector of it, where he would go okay. and create pamphlets to yeah. drop on Korea. like, like uh, Oh, okay. So they were doing it from Japan yeah. to send into Korea. So, oh, interesting. So he was in Japan. So I don't know if they ever met, but I did look up the class. Because he did have to go mm-hmm. take a bunch of class, and that was the textbook they used. So he no pretty much learned so cool. psychological warfare, which then went on to dictate the rest of his career in uh, politic- political science from this guy's textbook. That's so and cool. And I knew I recognized the name because that book was on his shelf. So No way. Yep. <laughs> uh, That's awesome. And then, oh, oh sorry, one more thing. So I, I couldn't find no, enough okay. from about him, so I have to actually go to the library at the university he taught at to look at his papers to see if he ever had any interactions with Lineberger, which I'm going to do when I go back home, maybe. Nice. So, yeah. Or That's I can awesome. just ask my grandma. But I did ask my dad. I'm like, do you know who Lineberger is? He's like, no. I'm like, I wouldn't expect you to. He's like, call grandma. <laughs> like, Famous one word answered. <laughs> yeah. Dad. No, call grandma. Like, I don't nope, think grandma is going to know either. Anyway, so that's my weird Not connection. Like, who is he? To your dad. That's super cool, yeah. though. I was really excited. That was a really fun uh, moment in it our uh, episode last week when you were just like, what? Yeah. Like, all the dates lined um, up. And I just wish he were alive so I could ask him. You know what I mean? God, you could have had him on the podcast. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Famously. He was very, famously very talkative, a great storyteller, but then Parkinson. Really? Yeah. Oh, he was so, I mean, an amazing storyteller. He'd always start like sentences and be like, did I ever talk about the guy, that time I shot a man? 
And that would be like how he like got people <laughs> That's a hook. comfortable, which I'm sorry, I really relate to that because that is how I do yeah. every interaction. Also, I like that that's how people get comfortable instead of uncomfortable. Be like, I don't I don't know if I'd get comfortable around a person who told me like, did I ever tell you about the time I shot someone? <laughs> but then he goes in and says, that it was an stress accident me out. and it was on Pearl yeah. Harbor. <laughs> uh. <laughs> <laughs> the day I shot Bud Nelson. That's the title of his chapter. Anyway, he accidentally shot his friend. That's awesome. And then came back that's into town. That's very Dick Cheney of him. He skipped. Accidentally. No, seriously. He was fine. His friend was fine. But he skipped church to go shooting and hunting. And he came back, accidentally shot his friend in the side of the head. Came back into town and found out that oh. Pearl Harbor had been attacked, and he was like, <laughs> "God is mad at me." <laughs> so that's what I mean. It's a hell of a story. Uh, but then he got Parkinson's and didn't tell stories anymore. So sad. Anyway, yeah, I'm sorry about that. It's okay. R.I.P. Right, rip. That's my thing. Anyway, do you have anything you want to like rip. talk about before we get going? Get into the tabs. No, I was actually mostly just curious because I know you were so excited when we yeah. finished recording last week to go see what you could find out. I so spent that's all, all I have. You know, deep dive. That's awesome. Deep dive. Um, okay. Well, I guess without further ado, uh, I went second last week then, right? Yeah. So that means I should go first. it's a two-parter as well. Two. It's a two-parter, which it's not a two-parter in the same way where there's not necessarily like one narrative thread that goes between the two of them. Uh, other than the person, like I said, Cordwain or Smith, but it's more just um, the first half was, was sort of about his career and yeah. what led him to writing books. And then the second half, I thought. Um, I would get into some of his writings because cool. I didn't know anything about him. I'd never heard anything about him. I'd never heard of any of his stories. Um, I think a lot of sci-fi like heads, yeah. particularly of the golden age, they all like like him and they know him and they respect him. But he's not like a particularly mainstream name the way that, you know, whoever, you know, Frank Herbert or somebody and, yeah. would be, Asimov, yeah, any of those guys would be. So it's like a jumping uh, off point, kind of like my Knee How episode where it's like, here's the island and then here's yeah, the yeah, incident yeah. kind of thing. Exactly. Okay, cool. Um, so just to sort of recap, as you said uh, last week, uh, we covered the life of author Paul Leinbarger, who literally wrote the book on psychological warfare. And we covered his insane upbringing of being the son of a U.S. judge in the Philippines, who became best friends with uh, Sun Yat-sen, the future president of the New Chinese Republic. But more importantly, he became <laughs> godfather to young Paul. And uh, he had this insane back and forth of going between Europe and Asia and China, uh, you know, East Asia and China. And specifically is where he spent a lot of time because his dad was like one of the chief propagandists. It's crazy, it's crazy. Wild. Go listen to it. It's a very strange uh, living, but he seemed like a pretty uh, kind of introverted but well-meaning guy who would kind of loved talking to people and seeing and learning and that kind of stuff. And became a professor, got his or sorry, he spoke like six languages and became a PhD in political science, became a professor, et cetera, and so on and so forth. And then he was in East Europe, oops, Eastern Europe, yeah, Eastern Asia, trying to stop uh, post World War II um, spread of communism, which is. Ooh. what we just uh, talked yeah, about which is... anyway so after that he comes back after he may or may not have met your grandfather <laughs> and uh i need to find out he was... i'll do a tab on it sometime <laughs> i really will all right i'm upset set on it anyway so paul was bedridden once again from his various nondescript lifelong health problems and oh. he started to take his uh writing more seriously which again this man has already been prolific and written all kinds of stuff and gotten all kinds of stuff published and he's writing for everything and everywhere but he also wants to write fiction on the side uh because he's nuts and apparently just like a super overactive imagination and brain which oh, i wish is i really knew what impressive. that was like um yeah right <laughs> now uh, speaking of stuff you're going to relate to so by 1950 he had actually published two mainstream novels under the name felix c forest which is a pseudonym that played on his given chinese name oh and Apparently, these books were kind of a hit and they got uh, fans and his fans figured out his identity. Oh, no. <laughs> and when they figured it out, Paul basically got writer's block and didn't know how to handle <laughs> the pressure of having an audience. <laughs> Super relatable. <laughs> and he was like, I will disappoint you all. Yeah. The key is, is to disappoint yourself so much that you don't care about anybody else. Just exactly. Have no expectations None. for anything. Also, don't look um, at people like they're real. They're all numbers. Just they're all yeah. They're all simulate. I don't know. I don't believe in simulation theory. Mm, just to spite everybody. I know everyone gets mad when you say that, but that's why I say it. Because I'm part of the programming of being a uh, contrarian. That is, they programmed you like that. That's true. Uh, I have no free will. Anyway, <laughs> so he. <laughs> nope. He basically is like, okay, cool. I'm just gonna come up with like another identity to write. Uh, from and uh, so no one has any expectations of anything. Hence, that's where Cord Wiener Smith is born. Smart. And uh, well, do you have a name that you would you would? Uh, 
you would do comics under if you didn't have to do it under Hannah uh, Hall? I wish I would have. I, I look looking back, I'm like, ooh, I should have done that, but I don't even know. I, here's the thing, I'm like. I wouldn't have been able to keep it a secret. I would have been like, by the way, guess what? Yeah, that's true. You would have told everybody. Just be like, yeah, did you, <laughs> did know? you know? I have a secret, have a secret identity. Name? And everyone would be like, yeah, we did because you've already told us. Yeah. Um, you're like that meme where they're in the corner and everyone's at the do party. Do they know? Like, they don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do they know that I have a secret identity? Like and how? everyone's like, yes, you told us about it five times. You told us already. I've always wanted yeah. to be mysterious. That's how you introduce and yourself. And like, I remember when, I think it was in high school when I realized that I wasn't mysterious. Yeah. I'm like, oh, man. All right. Man. That's a bummer. But yeah, I wouldn't. I don't know. I think I'm just too attached to my name. I mean, it's a good thing to be proud of your name. I don't think necessarily he was unproud of his name. I think he was just, it was Separation. like church and state. Yeah. He wanted to keep him separated, particularly because, you know, I'm sure it would have aroused suspicion that he was working with the, the CIA, CIA. And, the government. and then he was also writing science fiction. People have been like, what the shit? And I think also not just externally, but I think internally too. I think he was worried about like, what are these guys going to think that I'm writing science fiction? They're not going to th- like take me seriously. Oh yeah. Or like when you meet someone um, and they're like, oh, I'll go follow you, and then the first thing they see is some horrific thing you drew, and you're like, great, great. It kind, it kind of reminds time. me of uh, what's her name? Is it Stacey Abrams that has a secret? Uh, not secret, but she also writes like I think they're like romance no, spy novels or what? something. Yeah. Good for uh, her. her. That's public though. That's like a whole. And I'm just like apparently. I don't know if these people have free time or they're just their minds just do not stop. Uh, so props to you. Well, something's working up there. That, that yeah, doesn't it's work hardcore. For me. <laughs> it's really impressive. <laughs> I'm a little bit jealous if I think about it too much. Oh yeah, big time. You know what? I would be unstoppable if my brain worked. Unstoppable. Yeah, <laughs> so uh, I did the unthinkable, and I went the extra step and actually purchased. Ew. A book Whoa. of his short stories. Look at that. We're a legit podcast now. Uh, it's The Best of Cordwainer Smith, okay. edited by J.J. Pierce. Oh. And dear listener, let me tell you, it was Edited by Ray kind of Hill. <laughs> Just kidding. Ray Hill. <laughs> Anyway, it was kind of sorry. Go on. Uh, it was a little bit hard because uh, it's one thing to read for fun, but an entirely different experience uh, <laughs> when you have to like make sure you don't screw it up and present a Man. report when you're talking to people. Um, so uh, that was I'm a little bit rusty when it came to reading. Thankfully, they were short stories, which made it good. I could sort of go a la carte and pick, although they're not particularly short. They're a little bit long. Yeah. Some of them are like 30, 40 pages each. Oh, dang. So again, for a normal person who reads... It's probably not that much, yeah. but I'm just like I said, I don't read that much in uh-huh. necessarily a week long frame uh, time frame. So, but anyway, uh, it, the collection's pretty big. There's some fun ones, but um, for this tab, I decided to choose three of the stories cool. uh, that I thought were the most interesting or well known, just to sort of give you an idea of the kinds of stories he wrote. And um, I'm sure you can sort of extrapolate as to where you think some of his life experiences have played into how these stories got shaped. Love that. Okay. So before I get into all the stories, uh, I'm going to give you some interesting context okay. about his writing. So in total, he only wrote, he only wrote one proper book titled Nostralia. Oh. And the rest were short stories that were published in various print magazines at the time and later collected into you know a collection. Cool, um, cool. But his entire body of work takes place in one fictional future timeline. Oh, cool. He called it the instrumentality of mankind. Okay. So it's sort of like Tolkien where it's not like one hero all the way through, but like a bunch of yeah. different ones that happen throughout the history of this timeline. Uh, it's like some seriously hardcore world building. Cool. And um, someone did like a cool... Uh, I'm going to text it to you right now so you can see a timeline that sort of goes over when it starts to when it roughly ends. Whoa. Okay. So it starts in the year 2000. Yeah. And it ends in the year. I think it go- it's almost like the span of like 14,000 years of where it goes. Oh, it, yeah. It covers a lot of ground. Whoa. 16,000 AD. Uh, and of course, if you are not watching this on YouTube, if you're listening to it, you can watch us on YouTube, in which case uh, we will have... Images pop up on the screen. Sign up and subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't done yet. Yeah, it's worth it. Oh, this okay. This story sounds awesome. The game of rat and dragon and the burning of the brain. Love that. (laughs) I love this man. So the instrumentality originated as the police force of the Jewins or perfect ones on a post nuclear holocaust to Earth. Ooh. And after attaining power in the expansion of humans in space, they eventually entered a somewhat stagnant phase in which a fixed lifespan of 400 years uh, was imposed on human inhabitants of the planets, where the instrumentality directly ruled all the hard physical labor was done by the rightless animal-derived underpeople, oh. quote-unquote, <laughs> and children were never raised by their biological parents. So you basically have... Ew. You remember last episode I talked about, like, someone said that he sort of may or may not have birthed modern conspiracy yeah. theory? 
So there's like a, a mysterious master race in this universe that controls everything. Then there's humans who are like the normal people. And then there's kind of the chilling. Underlings, and like under humans? underlings, which are like human. Like, do you ever see? You probably have not, but you remember like Trying. Island of Doctor Moreau? Yeah, no. Yeah, so it's like alien. I'm sorry, it's like animal people hybrids who are like we don't have the same rights as humans do, <laughs> but we retain some of their, you know. Uh, because we're animals, we have empathy. We're weirdly better than them, but they don't understand. But they're right. primal, and humans need to, blah blah blah. But humans are sort of kept in this. I, th- I, I, again, I didn't read all of them. There's, there's quite a lot to read, and I only did so much. But I think they're sort of seen as like this Wally state where they're oh. like, kind of like uh, they're kept and they're entertained, and people are doing everything for them, and they're just sort of like blah blah blah. I can't break out of the matrix. <laughs> but you Got know, it. these animal people are miserable, and then the weird space Illuminati controls us. Um, Again, all that's true. To be clear, he did not, as far as I can tell, this guy wasn't into like the Illuminati or any of that stuff. I think he just was like writing weird stories based on his own experience. And, and also was in the CIA and probably like C- heard right. a lot of like crazy ideas because that's the time when the CIA was like, I don't know, can we mind control people? Maybe we can overthrow governments. Yeah. Maybe we can uh, destroy entire countries and reinstate their kings yeah. that uh, were ousted. Uh, anyway, I'm Yay. not bitter about that. No, so, not first at all. up. No, why would you be? <laughs> It didn't have lasting effects on anybody you know. Not at all. I'm not here. <laughs> that's not um, why you're here. <laughs> that's not why I'm here. So first up, the first story is called Scanners Live in Vain, which is probably his best known short work and broke him into the business as a proper science fiction writer that people all got really excited about. Cool. And he had pitched it to it a bunch of different places and everyone rejected it until finally mm. like one last place took it and then they made it and it sort of made a name for himself. So don't give up. Yeah. The main character of the story is a guy named Martel. Okay. Or Martel, depending on how you want to <laughs> I'm going to say so, Martel. Martel, Martel sounds stupid. <laughs> Martel. Martel works as a scanner who is essentially a cross between a doctor, a space pilot, and like a man-robot hybrid. Dope. Wait, that is yeah. crazy. I've never heard of anything oh, like that. You're not going to hear anything like any of these stories. You're going to love them all, I promise. Am I about to become a Cordwainer Smith fan? Yes, uh, absolutely. I can guarantee you yes, that there's yes, one yes. that you will. So in the future, humans figure out how to travel throughout space and inhabit other planets. Simple enough. Yeah. But space travel is apparently super duper painful, like almost unbearable. Oh. Like your body can't get through it. Whoa. So most people have to travel. And again, some of the details are a little bit confusing to me, but this is the best I can unpack from it. Yeah. Um, but so I think most people travel in like cryogenic sleep so right. that they don't like feel anything. But how do these ships get from point A to point B? It's uh, not AI and robots. They are crewed by prisoners <laughs> who, have, who have been converted to become what they call Habermans. Okay, that's exactly what we would do as humans. That's exactly what 100%. we would do. Yeah. Wow. Uh, oh, it gets more hum- human racy. Habermans <laughs> basically get all of their sensory cords cut off so they can't feel shit. <laughs> so like they can't feel Lobotomies? their bodies. They it's more than that it's like their uh, physical body is disconnected from them so they're, they're like they can't feel anything uh including emotions and even their basic senses like hearing and smelling are just ooh. turned way down so they're sort of like these vessels ooh. like basically like you can't even tell if your foot just got chopped off or if like you're having a heart attack like you don't know you're sort of like what oh Ooh. i'm bleeding out i didn't realize (laughs) need to pilot this ship who cares yeah wow the only way that they can tell that any of that stuff is happening is through their like it's like a settings function that appears on their chest that's on their chest (laughs) that looks kind of like a dashboard (laughs) cool so imagine there's like a giant like ipad on your chest that's like oh okay like your heart rate is up to like 35 do you want to adjust it like like a watch or something that's strapped to you yeah Yeah, like we have so you sort of go like like you're changing it all whatever and then you're like all right cool (laughs) those are great noises i think we should close our tabs to that noise you just made they're like "Hmm." (laughs) hannah hillam here she's a haberman let's turn the anxiety up to a 37 wait it's Mm, already doesn't seem to be doing much maxed out (laughs) gonna bring up her insanity oh looks like it's been all the way up for this entire time and broken it's broken you can't even turn it down yeah hey if mine's like that i'd love to see what your little iPad. Oh, my anxiety tab. Yeah. Forget it. It's it doesn't even it's exist. Like They're just like we've wires we didn't even like popping out of it. It's yeah. like been broken. Oh. They got the criminals who are like manning these ships, but they're not just gonna let a bunch of half robot like robbers and murderers like ship people <laughs> back and forth. <laughs> Why not? It's, it's crazy. Like they're not they don't trust them. Yeah. So they put the scanners in charge. Mm. 
And the scanners, they're like the captains of the ship and they monitor all the levels of everyone and make sure the whole thing runs smoothly. So that's when like the the doctory part oh, of it comes yeah. in. So they're like, okay, like this guy, you know, old whatever, Henry Kissinger war criminal is over here. Like <laughs> he's supposed to be in charge of loading in, I don't know, food to go into like the, <laughs> the cryogenic sleep people, but like his heart rate's like dangerously low. So the scanner's got to go over and be like, huh, his scan is low. I got to turn like, this up and make no sure he's got a heart rate. Here. Wait. Yeah. <laughs> How is this man still alive? Yeah. So they're the ones who are in charge of that. We're making sure that like everything's running smoothly. They're running the ships. They're doing it. And as you might expect, they're highly respected amongst the Normandy, the normies. Yeah. Who they call the others. So they're like, hey, cool. Like these scanners are like they're, uh, you know, because they didn't. Uh, they're not criminals. These are people who volunteered to do this job. Whoa. To like put themselves in like a lot of harm and detached and all this. So stuff. like like they're like sacrifice. Like they're like um. Yeah, like heroes. Like Yeah, wow. which you'd think is like awesome, but no, not for a scanner because no. the scanner doesn't feel anything and they don't care. It doesn't matter. They've had all their wires disconnected. They're like, that sucks, but them's the ropes. What are you going to do? <laughs> That's part of the job. It's part of the job. Have you seen Severance? But, uh, I started to watch like a couple of, I think I watched like the pilot and like half the first step, the uh, second episode, and then I never went back to it. Did you? Yeah. I, like I it. heard it's very good. It's People good. really like it. It's good. This is giving that kind of vibes where it's like, Kind of. I know you know, yeah, now. I think I know some of it. I think some of it might actually play into this. Yeah. Oh. From what I know about it. Because yeah. Because I know Sarah Washington. She talked about it. But anyway, so the scanners, however, they're not like the regular Habermans. They have a different out. Uh-huh. So they get like essentially PTO every few weeks where they get to engage in what is very unfortunately coined act of cranching, which is the <laughs> dumbest name ever. <laughs> Once again, cranching. That's like a combination of crunchy and ranch. So they think about ranch dressing being crunchy. Like crunchy. It's called cranching. Uh, are you? Did you go out cranching again? I was cranching. Uh, not a great name, but no. that is the term. Meet, meet me at the ley line so we can cranch together. Do you know if your teens are cranching? Watch Dateline NBC <laughs> at 10 p.m. Kids? tonight. It's yeah. 10 p.m. Do you know where your kids are? Are your children texting about cranching? <laughs> I love cranching. Love so it. Love a cranching? good cranch. So basically, when you're off the clock, you can cranch. And when you cranch, mm-hmm. all your feelings and senses come back. And you can actually be like a human being until, I don't know, Sunday night when you get depressed because you got to go back to scanning on Monday morning. Whoa. So you can like. They're basically like. Well, just be like a person. plan being a person. Yeah. So it's sort of like, I think part of it too is like, they're like, if we don't give them this, they become insane. So like, let's give them a little cranching time. It's like. <laughs> It's like, you know, when you're on a, when you're working out, you got to have like a cheat meal. This yeah. is like a cheat cranch. You got to just have like a period of time where you're able to actually feel feelings. <laughs> you just chug ranch dressing that's slightly crispy. <laughs> it's a little bit crunchy. It's been baked. Sick. That is Crunched. the dumbest word. It is, unfortunately. It's a very, un- and when I was reading the story, I just, every time it said cranching, I was like, like no, <laughs> oh, <laughs> why this one? <laughs> why? Cord wiener. Cord wiener with your crunching, with your cranching. Cr- so- <laughs> crunch on my cord wiener? Yeah. So the story begins with Martel trying to shift into cranch mode. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Martel (laughs) trying to shift into cranch mode. That's what it was. I love love that. By the way, I like this story. I'm not making fun of it. It's just called cranch and I have to laugh at it. I just like how you said it like you were like a prisoner like you'd have to say cranch mode and you're like cranch mode. Mode. all i pictured when he was doing it was that of george costanza where he's in line for, to go see the soup nazi and he's like quiet i'm <laughs> shifting into soup <laughs> mode <laughs> but he's like i'm trying to shift into cranch I'm mode shifting into cranch mode everybody <laughs> And he's like, and he's with his wife, Lucy, oh. but he's, he's really having a hard time snapping out of it. Uh. He's just like pissed <laughs> about everything <laughs> and how stupid his life is. And he doesn't know why Lucy even married him. And he's like oh. spiraling. I've never Again, done happy. that. Yeah, exactly. That's why I was <laughs> like, you're going to love these stories. <laughs> Basically, this story opens with him being like, I, he's like too angry to be able to function. And he's just like mad at everything. And I was like, hell yeah. Bro. Yeah, he is. Hell yeah, Martel. This guy's a bro. Love Martel. Um, and he's like. He's even like, I don't even know why like Lucy married me, like because she's like a nice person, like, and I'm great. just like this terrible, yeah. And I feel sorry for her. Basically, he's like kind of feeling sorry for himself. He's totally spiraling. Yeah, very relatable. He's 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 not having a great time. Yeah. And it's like a whole back and forth, and his wife's trying to help him, 
And, you know, it's like taking like kind of two steps forward, like three steps back kind of thing, back and forth, back and forth. Uh He's starting to calm down a little bit. And then suddenly uh, he gets a call from his boss, Vomak. Okay. Oh, no. So in his scanner state, Vomak is like, dude, uh, emergency meeting, all hands on deck. Uh-oh. And remember, so Vomax, his boss, he's he's not cranched. Okay. He's like like whatever robotic right. scanner. So he's just like emergency meeting, all hands on deck. You got to go. And Martell is like, dude, bro, straight up, I'm cranching the gnar right now. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know. The grill is off in this cranch sesh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's like, I don't know if you really want me in this meeting. I'm straight cranching. <laughs> I can't and Vomax is like, <laughs> do it i can't think it through <laughs> all right all right cranch on please cranch yeah i'll cranch on and vomax is like dude don't even trip just roll through this is like super important you gotta report and so martell is all annoyed because basically he has to go into work on a saturday but <laughs> and he's like that sucks but you know at least all the homies are there including his bff chang okay who's like a half chinese dude dope uh which is the first indicator of what um Cordwiner's, you know, real life was like. Yeah. So he's got this best friend who's this dude, Chang, who's like really good at scanning, uh, but also like really good at like, you know, uh, mimicking empathy even when he's in his scanner state. Oh, nice. I can relate to that. Uh, he loves him. I'm just kidding. And then the other dude is this guy, uh, Parazianski, who's this Polish dude who's also kind of chill. And like those are kind of his, his homies that are in the group. I like that. And they call the meeting in order and they have a whole call and response being like, bro, our, la- our lives like straight up suck, <laughs> but we're the shit because we're harder than everybody else. So we get like a lot of respect and also scanner bros before normie hoes above all else. <laughs> it's meant to make you laugh. I'm it's okay. I'm in control. You don't have to I know. It's meant- good. It's Wait, fine. No, I meant to make you good. go off the rails. I- oh, um, is that what you're no, trying to like do? No, ca- it's like this call and response where they're just like, they're getting them like hyped yeah. up. Like before every meeting, they're just like... We do the hard work, but yeah. we have respect and normal people can't do the shit that we do, but that's cool and it doesn't matter. And like, we're awesome. And like, you what know, everyone tells scanner themselves blood. when they're in a prison yeah. that someone else is making. Yeah. They're in like a weird cult, yeah. essentially. And remember, Martella, like I said, he's normcore cranched out throughout <laughs> all of this. <laughs> okay. Uh-huh. And he's the only one that's normal. And he's just like, damn, I never realized how stupid and culty all this oh, shit is. Like, no. this is getting a little bit sus. Like, what the hell is happening? And he's like noticing all these different things that no one else notices when they're in their state. And he's just like, hmm, this is getting a little bit weird. Maybe the cranching and isn't all, maybe this isn't all it's cracked up to be. Yeah, it's not it's all cranched up to be. <laughs> no, cranching is good. I know. Not cranching. He's like, this is questionable. So eventually, the reason for the emergency meeting is revealed. Uh, there's this scientist named Adam Stone, and he has allegedly figured out a way to make space travel bearable for normal huh? people without suffering immense pain. Oh, my goodness. Finally. And Martell is like, yes, exactly. He's like, dude, hell yes. I don't have to go through all this like limp dick, like adjusting back and forth anymore. And I can just take my wife to like Olive Garden without crying first. And that's awesome. (laughs) He can. I would love that. He's he's so happy. He's like, this is the best news ever. I thought Olive Garden and crying were just part of the whole Olive Garden experience. That's part of the cranching experience. Uh, I really relate to cranching. Is that weird? Like, do. I, no, I do, relate to a lot of do this. Do you find yourself like you'll like be in a situation and you're like, this is deeply, deeply sad and existential, Let's, and I am, I am not real. Listen, <laughs> I don't want to, um, I don't want to editorialize here, but there's a lot of stuff in the way that he writes. Yeah. That I was like, this is a neurodivergent mm, person. Oh uh, yeah. This is not a person, is a person who's neurotypical. Who has to live among people that he's like, I don't. I don't understand your ways, and I have to pretend like I do. Yeah, it's really... Highly masked. It's Yes, yes, it's yeah. masked. Uh, it, a lot of the stories are. It's really interesting. Uh, I felt very seen. Yeah. Um, but anyway... <laughs> <laughs> I, it's like kind of like making me uncomfortable how much I'm related to relating to this, and so I'm, I'm trying to yeah. like shut down my oh, it's feelings. It's only going to get better, but, by the um, way. This is just the one story. Oh. <laughs> You're going to love... No, but in a good way, not in a bad okay. way. You're going to enjoy it. But anyway, so he's like, this is going to be awesome. We can finally like live our lives. But all the scanner bros are like, actually, dude, no, that sucks, and it's not sick at all. That's straight up garbage, because... If anyone can travel through space, then the scanners won't be respected anymore. Mm. And then what do we do? Find new jobs? No thanks. <laughs> uh oh. So this is like <clears throat> a so, classic matrix kind of thing where it's like Yeah, yeah. and, and they, they put it to a vote and 
basically the majority is like, yeah, no, we need to kill this Adam Stone guy before <laughs> he like releases this tech. Like, screw him. Cool. And, sort of. you know, everyone votes on it and everyone's down with it, except Martel, because yeah. he's cranched out. He's he's crying at Olive Garden. He doesn't want to do he's that anymore. Like, he doesn't want to do it anymore. He's having he's listening to My Chemical Romance and he's like, I'm feeling feelings. Yeah. And they're not fun. But you know what? It's, they're not fun. It's but it's it's something which is kind of like an overarching theme in his work, which is like, you know, even pain is OK, because at least that means you're alive and life is not meant to be pleasant from beginning to end. Oh, I like that. That's what I learned in therapy. Yeah. And Martel is like, I don't know. And he tries to vote against it. And they're like, oh, don't Matt. Don't. He's sort of pushed to the side. They're like, disregard. He's in a cranching state. He's we respect him normally, but like you can't you can't take him seriously. You right can't now. respect and, a crancher. Can't respect a Crancher. And to make matters worse, they send uh, Parazienski to do the t- the killing, his Polish friend. Oh, okay. And he's just like, damn it. So Martel is like, dude, no, we can't we can't let this happen. So the story just becomes this quick race to get to Adam Stone first before they do to assassinate him. Ugh. And Martel does all this crazy undercover stuff and he pretends to be like a normie and gets the stone first. So he's got like some strange nail that he has to like write stuff on that he's like, oh, I got to break this nail off in order to like be undercover. So he sort of like does all these different things to like let go of his of his scanner identity. And he gets there and it's like the middle of the night and he's sort of and he's sort of like unloading on stone. And he's like, oh, you got to do this. You got to come with me right now. Like, kind of like Terminator. <laughs> like you got to come with me if you want to live. Yeah. And then at that moment, uh, Parzianski appears and Martel has no choice but to kill him. Oh. He basically just like rums up his his like thing on his chest and he's just like, he, your heart rate goes all the way up and he just explodes. He has to kill his, his friend. best friend. <laughs> Chang is his best friend, but he's also another one of his yeah. like, he's, let's say he's his work friend. His work wife, his work husband. His work wife. So he's, And he's bummed about it. He doesn't want to do it, but he's like, dude, if, the, if he kills this guy, he can't. And he's like, I can't do it. Mm. Sort of like reacting in his cranch mode. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dude. But it's it's a tragic ending, but it's somewhat happy because over time the scanners are surgically restored to being people again, hey. and they become spaceship pilots because the government p- helps them move into new jobs, and they still retain their prestige. You know, this you can absolutely see is an a- his actual life reflected almost exactly oh, in yeah. this. Speaking of which, the failed murder plot though is covered up by explaining that Parizianski died because he neglected to monitor his bodily functions due to his joy in learning of Stone's work. Oh, the end. Wow. So it ends with a conspiracy. Ooh, wait, I love this. Yeah. You like that one, yeah. Hannah? You're going to like this one even more. Do it. Make me feel deeply uncomfortable with how real every, all of this is. It's good. Um, no, no, I spruced this up. So that one, that was the deep one. That was like the really famous one that like sort of got him started in his career. That was his so, debut? That was amazing. That was his debut science fiction work, I believe, that got published under his name of Cord Wainer Smith. Cool. So you remember, he had written other stuff. Oh, right, But right, it wasn't right. stuff like this. It wasn't part of this whole thread. So you mentioned a title, The Game of Rat and Dragon. <laughs> so this is what I was immediately attracted to that one. And this is one of the ones you're talking about. This one is tailor made for I you. I am predictable. <laughs> Yes. So this is a story about a guy named Underhill. Hold and... on. <laughs> That's a family name. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah. Go on. It's so weird. I know. It's I well, what do you get when I you like I'm from my family's from Yorkshire and they all have hobbit names. It's just all like Overend, Underhill, Dinsdale, Bywater. Is, is this related to your grandfather? Yeah. And your grandfather This is um, my grandpa's I side. You, I wonder if Underhill was a name that he mentioned at some no, point. No, this, this was came way in. back. Probably not. No, he I'm trying to make connections. I'm grasping for straws. No, I just here's the thing. I'm like a name nerd, and so I remember every single name like name six hundred years back, which is not normal. Anyway, speaking of sure. neurodivergent. That's cool, though. Sure. Go on. Uh anyway, so Underhill, he's a telepathic space fighter who mans what is called a pin set, which super heightens his psychic abilities. Ooh, okay. Now, uh, within the Cordwainer Smith timeline, remember the thing I showed you earlier, this is about 3,000 years after the whole scanner debacle. Oh, okay. So the way th- they travel through space is a little bit different. And it seems like now their spaceships, uh, from what I can tell, they sort of jump from one vector to another in two dimensional space super duper quickly until they arrive at their destination and I guess like materialize into three dimensions. Oh, that's cool. Sort of. It's wild. I didn't quite understand it. I like the, the imagery of that. I think that would yeah. make a really cool movie, like that's that like, yeah, that would going look 2D like. and then popping out yeah, to 3D. It would, yeah, because you could also like make it really like very like early gra- like graphics and stuff looking, you know. Anyway, yeah, Tron. And so, 
Now, traveling this way is no problem. They're not dealing with like a bunch of pain and stuff because all that's been solved right. by Adam Stone, remember, in the past. When you, and especially when you're within the rays of the sun. So basically, if you're in the sunlight, it's okay. It's fine. There's no problems. But if you go into the darker areas of space where there's no sunlight, shit starts to get real. Okay. And there are these psychic beings that for all intents and purposes are aliens. Okay. Um, whom if you cross paths with them, you will result in sudden death or insanity. <laughs> <laughs> Not great. That reminds me of this like Welsh legend where like if you go up this certain mountain in Wales, you either come down like a genius poet or you come down insane. Mm -hmm. And there's yeah. no in between. <laughs> there's no in between. Cool. So and in the in the mind of Underhill and the other telepaths that are part of these of these trips, they're seen as dragons in their mind's eye. What? There's dragons in this? That's dope. Do okay. they see them as like space dragons, which again, another connection to like his China. whole like connecting, <laughs> yeah, being connected to China. Because it's so quick and primal. So this happens very, very fast. It, because it's so quick and primal, humans fall back on their most base associations with such a danger. So it's like not just a regular beast, it's a beast that has its own sort right. of uh, intent and like and, and smarts about it and it's different it's not just like a angry bear or something it's right. like this mythical thing it's legendary like yeah and, exactly yeah and and the uh the telepaths are equipped with these like essentially like light bombs oh, cool. to scare the dragons away yeah, yeah i'm obsessed <laughs> with this I'm, tr I'm, yeah. I'm trying to maintain my chill i don't have chill what yeah. are we talking about but the reflexes required to fight these dudes, uh, these dragons, is literally milliseconds. Okay. So like, because they're traveling at like whatever light speed through all these things. And as you're like going from vector to vector to vector at like whatever, five times the speed of light. Yeah. These dragons pop up and like the telepaths who are hooked up to these things that are like super duper like amplifying their abilities. You're talking like 0.5 milliseconds. They're just like, oh, blip, 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 blip. They got to kind of blast them with light, almost like a weird video game. Yeah. But like. The shine of the light sort of gets them to go away so that everyone doesn't go insane and die. But of course, sometimes the dragons can be even faster than like 0.5 milliseconds. Okay. So there can barely be any margin of error. <laughs> Not stressful. So, so they think to themselves and they're like, hmm. And they come up with a plan to ensure space travel is safe for everybody and they need extra protection. And they're like, if telepathic humans are not the fastest reflex to animal on Earth, what is? You want me to guess? Any, uh, any ideas? Um, yeah, you want to guess? My first thought was like a cheetah. That's a good guess, actually. But but no, that's not what it is. You know what it is? A frog. Nope. What? Cats. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> well, my cat just stared at me like I'm insane. Sorry, dude. I woke you up. <gasps> There's cats in this. Okay, space cats that fight space dragons. Is that what we're talking about here? Oh, this is why you chose this. Okay. Yes. They're like, okay, dude, cats reflexes are crazy fast. Yeah. So here's the plan. And they're We're interstellar make, like, beings. I, I've always said this. I've always said that cats did not come here. They did not evolve on this earth. I think they were sent here. That's all. That's my, <laughs> I have a whole graphic novel idea about that. I love it. Yeah. So they're like, here's the plan. We're going to make like a sidecar spaceship. That's like the size of a football. <laughs> okay. A and attach a miniature pin set, much like they have on the, uh, yeah. the psychics, I'm sorry, on the telepaths, complete with a psychic helmet, and boom, now you can mind meld with your own personal cat who has its own mini light bombs that it can fire at the dragons. <laughs> <laughs> ah, what? <laughs> cat people out, October 8th. But yeah, yes. uh, you get to mind, it's like a kaiju with like a tiny cat. It's exactly right. Yes. It's, it's like Pacific Rim. You're mind melding with your miniature cat that's, that's like also shooting at the dragons. Space cats. I'm, obs Space I'm cats. obsessed with this. All right. Although, although the cats, because they have their own primal instincts, do not see the dragons as dragons. Uh -oh. They see the dragons as rats. <laughs> Hence the title, The Game of Rat and Dragon. <laughs> this sounds like, like a way cooler Game of Thrones with like mind meld cats and like... Space dragons that look like rats? Yeah. Obsessed. Um, obsessed. You've sold me. I, I figured you would. I'm obsessed. So the story is, is is it's one of the shorter ones, but my favorite part of this, it's it's this has nothing to do with the main plot, but it's just a throwaway line that he writes about how in space cats are like super respected because like they help them fight all the dragons and uh -huh. stuff, but on Earth they're just normal cats. They're not like <laughs> they're not like <laughs> and so one time. Underhill remembers he's like one time he went back to the surface and he saw a cat and like saluted it and everyone's like what the shit is wrong with you what are you doing you idiot <laughs> this is not good podcasting me just yelling and screaming but it's just 
<laughs> this is exactly how I see cats. Uh-huh. To me, they're not these little cutesy things. They're like these bizarro freaks who also yep. live in your house. And this is perfect. Yep. And he was all like embarrassed, but he's but like under him under his breath. Hold to on, himself. I gotta he's salute like, my cat. Yeah, right. And at first, everybody was like, "What are you doing?" And he's just like, "Oh, sorry." And then under his breath, he's just sort of like, "You idiots don't even know what these cats <laughs> have, have done no for us." <laughs> so the story itself, as far as what happens, isn't that crazy. It's just sort of about like one specific trip that Underhill takes with three other telepaths. Yeah. And they have a system of picking which cat goes with who based on they just like roll a dice. So like every trip is a little bit different. You don't have like your main cat okay. that you do with. Oh, okay. So it's like each trip it's like, oh, I, uh, I don't know. So one Am of the I cats is named. Whiskers? Oh, yeah. What are their names? Right. Exactly. So only two of them are named. Okay. <laughs> one of them uh, is named Captain Wow, which. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> Captain Wow? <laughs> Excellent cat name. That's me on the <laughs> podcast. All I say is wow. I'm Captain Wow. Oh my god, you're right. I'm Captain Wow. <laughs> you, I'm gonna die, dude. This is too much. <laughs> this is too much for me. <laughs> oh my god, you're right. What's, you're literally Captain Wow. I'm Captain wow. wow. So Captain Wow. What's the next cat name? Better yet. Captain Wow is a Persian cat, by the way. <gasps> Even We're both Captain Wow. We're both Captain Wow. You know what, though? I don't think um, they're from Persia, but whatever. It's fine. Right. But Underhill doesn't get Captain Wow on this oh. trip. He gets paired with Lady May. Okay. I mean, okay. Who In Chinese, is also May Persian means cat. beautiful. I bet you that's part oh, yeah. of it. Is it M-E-I? Uh, he wrote it as M-A-Y, right. but I wonder if at that point he was like trying to anglify it. Anglify, yeah, is that the word? Anglicize it. Ang- anglicize it so that it sounds more like Western appropriate. Instead yeah, of just having to. I don't think people in the fifties were like. What's, name. They would be like, "Yeah, what's with all these Chinese names in the book?" He probably was like, you know, again, considering how much of his work has Chinese influences, I wouldn't yeah. be surprised if that was the case. Um, oh. But she's also a Persian, and she sounds like a very classy cat. Oh, okay. And again, hilarious. And like the back half of the story. Is just about how like tasteful she is and how much he loves being paired with her mind. And like he feels like more confident and sure about everything when they're like synced up together. But <laughs> what is this really about? I don't know. <laughs> like, to me, that's like, huh, what's uh yeah. he's just like, this is such an elegant cat. And he's like, she doesn't she's not uh, impressed by any of my talk about like space and Shakespeare. She just likes that I'm like a good person. Like that's what cats can do. Me they respond me. to you. Yeah, kind of what it is. Not the CIA agent. No, I'm just kidding. I'm like trying to relate it to his real life, bro. So what have you done? Yeah, I don't know. I've made you a Cornwainer Smith, Cordwainer Smith fan. So when they start, when they finally start to make the jump, they do encounter a dragon slash rat, and some shit goes down. And thankfully, Lady May handles it, and everything turns out okay. But it was a very close call. She's a professional, and she's a professional, and he's a professional. And afterwards, he's in the hospital because. This is standard practice because even for the telepaths, pin lighting is a crazy strain on their minds and they need like two months of recovery in the Whoa. hospital for every one trip they take. I love how realistic that is because I you hear yeah. these like sci-fi stories and you're like, there's no there's no way a human can do any of this. But yeah. So it's like even cool. if you're like a telepath who's super strong and you're hooked up to this thing, they're like, you you, just, you need to recover for like a couple months. So the lifespan of, a, of, of their entire career is only about 10 years. Whoa. <clears throat> before they're like burned out. And so most of them are pretty young. Uh, but even I think at this point, he's only like 26 years old and he's like getting ready to, or actually no, somebody that's there that's like setting him up. He's one of the guys who's getting ready to retire. But anyway, so the story ends with him waking up and the first thing he does is ask about Lady May. He's oh. like, is she okay? And um, <laughs> the nurses are like, don't you want to know if your crewmates are dead? And he's like, no, whatever. No one cares about them. <laughs> Everyone is fine, by the way. Good. And then he temp- he temporarily hijacks the nurse's mind. Oh. And he's like, man, people like absolutely suck. They ain't got <laughs> shit on Lady May. I wish more people were cats. This the person end. is neurodivergent. <laughs> yeah. This man. I'm sorry. I'm not yeah. a psychologist, but I think I can comfortably diagnose him as something. Like the fact, the way that he interacts with the world and like these like exhausting like interactions that you have to recover from. Uh-huh. Like. Yeah. That's like after a convention, I'm like, I'm going to be alone for two months now. Yeah, so, same with me. Uh, same with me. Fascinating. And loving animals um, so, more than people. That's a big thing. Yeah. So that's the end of that story. Basically, from what I can tell, I think he wrote this story in like a day. Yeah, uh, I did. <laughs> <clears throat> this is one that he had. This is one of the ones that he just sort of, it all came out in like one fell swoop. And I guess he lived in this place that was like 
I think he had like 10 or 12 cats. Ooh. So like that was like part of his inspiration. Yeah. So cats show up like a couple of times throughout his stories. Yeah, they do. They're weird little so, guys. They're weird little guys. Yeah. Uh, he, and like I said, there's the whole um, animal under, uh, what is it called? Um, oh, under people uh, or whatever. Under people. Yeah. So there's like a whole thing, which I think some people could interpret it as race relations mm. and sort of, you know, being seen as that. I think it's maybe a little bit more just like this dude really likes animals. Yeah. And he's personifying them because he wants people to like respect animals more. Yeah. But it's that sort of the jury's out on that one. Wow. Captain Wow. I'm Captain Wow. And I'm a space so, cat. The last story I'm going to talk about is called Mother Hitten's Little Kittens. <laughs> this better do numbers. This better do numbers on Instagram. Seriously. Uh, and by the way, <laughs> Little Kittens is spelled L I T T U L. And then Kittens is spelled K I T T O N S. Interesting. <laughs> Great. The spelling is important. Okay, okay. Mother hit, Hittens? Hittens. Little Kittens? Yes. Yeah, do you want me to text it to you so you can No, no, look I'm good. I got spelling? it. I got it. No? Okay. Yeah. Mother Hittens Little Kittens <laughs> is about a dude uh, named Benjacomen Bozart. <laughs> Benjacomen. Okay. Benjacomen uh, Bozart. So he's an interplanetary thief who yeah, has his is. eyes set on the planet of Nostralia, which was... Settled by sheep farmers from a post-nuclear war Australia. Yes. The sheep that were brought to this planet suffered a local infection that caused them to grow larger than houses. I'm, a, I'm, and become I'm obsessed with completely this. immobile. Oh my gosh. Woo! This feels like something I would draw. Oh. This feels like something I would have loved to have written. You've 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 derailed me. I love this. Yeah. Um, these gigantic house-sized house size sheep are completely immobile Aww. and they require constant attention, but the infection also generates strune, also called the Santa Clara drug, which is what halts the aging in humans. Oh. Because remember it said that humans are like, you know, a couple hundred years old. This is yeah. where they get them from the gigantic uh, house size sheep that mutated on this planet. I love this world he's created. This is insane. It's crazy. Yeah. So <clears throat> naturally- uh, and Australia becomes the richest, yeah. most important planet in this entire. And everyone universe. wants that wolf sheep wool. What is it? Yeah, wool. Uh, strewn, <laughs> and then the Santa Clara drug, which I don't know what that's all about. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. that's what it's called. So now the Australians are, I guess, also like super strong, and I don't know if that's because they're taking this stuff and it's concentrated, and that's why they're super strong, yeah. or they're just like. If it's like a commentary on like Australians being, you know, taller than everybody and generally like pretty strong. I don't know, whatever it is. But for whatever reason, the Australians are like not normal, uh, your average people. Like you can't mess with them. And uh, Benji Komen, old Benji, Benji can't take him on. So he goes to the planet and he has he comes up with this plan. So he finds this kid, an Australian, and he gets him to spill the beans on how all the strewn is protected. And he eventually kills this kid, but not <laughs> before this kid can spell out. Mother Hitten's Little Kittens in the Sand, because it happens on the beach. I want to be what on what he's on. That good, <laughs> yes. solid CIA LSD. There's no other. Yeah. There's, this, this is CIA acid. Yeah, so this kid's like dying, and he's just like, Mother Kitten. He's just like, who do you work for? Where? How are you protected? Blah, blah, blah. And he like writes it out in the sand. Misspells it. And this kid's dead, and then no, <laughs> Benji's like, oh, no, what happened? This kid just died. I don't know. That's so sad. But like, uh, whatever. What? Sorry, I'm going to go to my hotel. And he basically writes down this thing, and he's like, what the hell is Mother Kitten's little, or Mother Hitten's little kittens? He's like, this doesn't even make sense. It's spelled weird. Is that kid like, you know, was Dyslexic. his brain all mushy because I poisoned him? Like, what's, I don't know. <laughs> And he's like, but I can't ask anybody about it because then they're going to know I'm trying to figure out like how this whole thing is protected. So uh, he decides to go to the library. Okay. <laughs> Naturally. And yeah, the Australian library. And he's like, no one's going to track me here. Wrong. Yeah. Yeah. He goes and he does like, basically he goes and does like a whatever Google word search <laughs> or a Google search. And then it's like a word that like, boom, immediately <laughs> pings the Australian FBI and like alarms go off. <laughs> and they're like, terrorists, this person's clearly trying to kill everybody. Also, like, why would he be searching for this word yeah. or like this phrase if he's not an Australian? Also, all an Australians already know what this is. They would never be stupid enough to go to the library or search and it. search it, yeah. Oh, he gave himself away. So all of a sudden, this like insane plan starts to play out that uh, is not only going to destroy him, <laughs> but also bankrupt his entire planet that he's from. <laughs> 
That's a lot. These fools are ruthless. <laughs> ruthless. Um, anyway, th- there's a whole story that plays out about like this guy thinking he's getting like one lead after the next, but really he's just like playing into the plan. This of, is of the getting CIA. Killed. This is his whole yeah. experience with this. Literally, CIA. yeah. And he's just got this false sense of confidence all the way through. He's wow. just like, oh yeah, I'm gonna take all this. I'm gonna take all my funds from like my home planet and then take them to this other planet because like that's gonna like quadruple my money. It's like uncut gems, basically. He's just like, you're like, bro, what are you doing? Uh, so in the interest of time, I'll sort of just get to the punchline of it. Yeah. Okay. Eventually, <laughs> Benja Komen figures out that the entire planet's defense system is run from a local moon and run by who they call Mother Hitten. Oh, my gosh. Okay. <laughs> Mother Hitten is the weapons mistress yeah. and takes care of the, quote, little kittens. The big sheep. No. Oh. Oh, The nukes. little kittens... Are in fact mink. Oh, <laughs> minks. Like mink, minks mink. is our mink. Yeah, mink is the plural. Yeah, mink. Uh, mink that have been selectively bred for centuries for psychotic, <gasps> self-destructive madness. Is this gonna be MK Ultra? Are we getting into like? <laughs> okay, so okay, so this woman is the weapons mistress, and she is selectively breeding mink to be insane or to cause insanity. They've been bred to be insane over hundreds and hundreds of years. Oh, my gosh. Okay. All right. Long story short, these ins- and they're like kept in like a vegetative state where they're like, <laughs> you have to be sleeping all the time because if they wake up, it's insane. So <laughs> es- essentially what happens is, is like anytime there's a threat, she'll wake them up and then all their psychotic like anger and energy and like psychosis just starts going mad. And then they like take all of like their intense telepathic beams and like or sorry they take all their like <laughs> things that are going on and then they like put it into a telepathic beam that can be directed at any coming any incoming spaceship from the relay station Whoa. and like shoot it at them a, they're like biologic well, like biological weapons biological and psychological and essentially what they do is they can take that they shoot that beam <laughs> and whoever they shoot it at shoot it at uh, it'll drive any human into a self-destructive madness, which is exactly what happens to Benja Komen as he tears his own body apart yeah. and tries to eat himself. <laughs> really? <laughs> this is the guy that taught my grandpa about psychological warfare. That's just, that just hit me. That just hit me again. <laughs> Listen, you can't mess with people's money, bro. You can't mess with no. it. I just like the the idea of a psychic beam of insanity being sent to an enemy by mink. Exactly. Huh, I you you have brought me a gift. <laughs> yeah. Benjamin Benja Komen dies. The end. That's yeah. the end of the story. He just tears himself to pieces. And they and they bankrupted his planet. Oh. Well, he shouldn't have gone messing with Mother Hitten's little kittens. Exactly. He shouldn't have done it. Yeah. Karma. Anyway, this is just a small sample of some of the unbelievable stories that this man wrote. And obviously, I've gone extremely long today. <laughs> so I did not it get into like, like all the nothing. other stuff. It has felt like no time. I know. It's, his stories were so great. They're oh, so insane. I, I really hour. recommend them. Oh, they're all like so bizarre. I really like them a lot. But I think um, that our Discord, regards... the sketch, the, the, the doodles tab in the Discord. Oh, is gonna yeah. Go they're going to go crazy with yeah. this one. Yeah. Anyway. Captain Wow. But, you know, so I'll just wrap it up. But tragically... Um, oh. Paul Leinerbarger's life was cut short when he died of a heart attack oh. at 53. No, that is In 1966, young. very young. Oh. I mean, who knows how much more crazy shit that guy could have written. Uh, I mean, again, he's prolific. Yeah. He's prolific. Wow, what uh, a In bummer. such a short period of time. Um, I didn't even, like I said, there was all this other stuff. I didn't even get into it. I was like, I don't know. Maybe I'll do another tab, like explaining the rest of what happened to him. But I just really, I started to read the stories because I just wanted to get an idea of them. And I'm like... They're too funny. They're too (laughs) insane. They're too specific for me not to just like talk about these stories, especially because the first half I talked so much about his his own personal history. But anyway, you can see the you can see how it lines up perfectly. It's so funny. Yeah. I mean, you can uh, I'm sure everybody can sort of make their own um, extrapolations about like what came from his upbringing and what came from his life experiences. And but again, just fascinating character. Wrote really weird stories that are fascinating, and I kind of loved all of them. Um, I'll probably keep reading the rest of the book and finish them, but I highly recommend it. Truly loved that. That was I. Lo- I love finding another person that I can like. It's like I feel like I'm we're on the same weird wavelength. wavelength. Yeah, unhinged. Well, if you like interplanar um, travel and cats, my book is coming out uh, one month. So actually, yeah. 
Anyway. Okay, it's very much, he would have loved cat people. He would I feel like he would have been super into cat he, people. He would have been, in fact, like, make it you weirder. should reprint the book and then have a quote from Cordwainer Smith <laughs> on like, the outside of cool. it. This is cool. Yeah. I use this book to psychologically change hearts and minds <laughs> in the Korean War. Oh, uh, by the way, you know how I was making a clay figurine of Henry Clay slash Harry Clay? Yeah. Yeah. Whoa, oh, there that's he is. awesome. Is he wearing a scarf? No, he's wearing like an old timey like tie. That's awesome. He looks well done. Thanks. I will uh bake it and give it to somebody. Maybe we can give it as a giveaway. In the Patreon. <clears throat> um In the Patreon. And yeah, if you anyway. Yeah, this is that was that was incredible. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> like Yeah. That was a fun one. Yeah. That that checked all the boxes of the things I Craziness. love. Yeah. Yeah. Uh well, I feel like I gotta come down from that a little bit. Why don't you tell us what you got for your tab this week? Well, speaking of rats and uh, <sighs> rodents and animals. It's a rat. No, uh, well, it's rat adjacent. But before I get into it, mm-hmm. I'm going to give myself a little to give a little tab update, right? Like the last couple of okay. weeks, I keep hitting 500 open tabs in my Safari. <laughs> or, or, yeah, in Safari. And it has enraged me because I'm like, I don't have the I don't have the time to go through them, through them all. So finally, I sat down and was like, I'm going to get this down to 400 tabs. And I did. I got it down to 400 tabs. Um, Congratulations. It is now back up to, hold on, hold on, 444. So. Um, <laughs> and 44 of those tabs are just you trying to like open up a link yeah. to log back into like mm-hmm. Bank of America or Over something and that I never would, closed. Yeah. There's, there's so many of the ones I closed. Anyway, so if that tells you anything about the deep dives I've been on this week. Um, okay. I went down. I don't even remember where this started, right? But I have okay. gone down an art history rabbit hole so insane and vast that I had a hard time focusing in on one thing, but I think I've got it. So this is all about one specific instance of a piece of lost art that was then refound later. So cool. for some background, the piece I'll be talking about is called sleeping lady with black vase. And I'm going to send you a photo of it. This is a great opportunity to go to the YouTube. And I don't even know if you've heard about this already. I hope not. It's kind of like an internet story, you know? Oh. Sleeping Lady with Black Vase. Yeah, I can send Until it to I you. I see it, I don't remember. Yeah. So there's Sleeping Lady with Black Vase. <laughs> Very uh, straightforward name. I don't, not know, I don't know this. Okay. Let me guess. So this is it's uh, this... early 1900s. Yeah. 1928. Uh, so it was done by a uh, Hungarian avant-garde artist, Ro- uh, Robert Berini. And he is one of the like many Hungarian artists at the time that were inspired by the French who were like pushing back against the realism of what was happening before and getting kind of into cubism and impressionism and stuff like that or ex- expressionism yeah. and um, yeah. going kind of more abstract with things as was the, you know, that's kind of how it was for everybody all around the world in every creative sp- sphere, 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 <laughs> whatever. And so one of his most important pieces was actually a portrait of Bella Bartok the Hungarian composer and that was mm-hmm. what he was kind of known for and he kept he was painting and doing all this stuff all through World War One and exhibiting around Europe and then in the interwar years he he uh worked for the communist government of Hungary and did okay. like posters and propaganda so there's a little tie-in um after the communist government fell uh Berini was like I gotta get to I gotta get out of here because <laughs> I kind of like associated See myself later. with the wrong people yeah to survive, uh, and he goes to Berlin, which is obviously just a peaceful, wonderful place in the 1920s, you know? Fantastic. Not on the brink of anything. Uh, and he continued Nothing. painting and like also like, <laughs> what? He's all, I got to cleanse that reputation. I'm headed over to where the Nazis are. They're, oh, they're, they're, they're not quite there yet, but oh, okay. Berlin at this time was like awesome. Everyone was having a blast. There was like, every, I mean, if, if the Nazis had never taken over... Things like you said what year? Sorry. 1920s, the 1920s. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Before so they come to power. it yeah. was like. Wide Martin shit. Yeah, exactly. My Weimar Republic. And it was, people were like doing stuff like, you know, being gay in public and it was fine. Just banging everything yeah. and everybody. It was an awesome time. There was like early uh, gender reassignment surgeries happening. And like if, that's a whole I different tab. Yeah. But like if yeah, Hitler yeah, hadn't yeah. have taken over, uh, we would have been so far ahead with like uh transgender like studies and and medical stuff than we are which is yeah I th- awful i think but, we talked about it when we just when we talked about cabaret on oh, the, yeah. the other podcast yeah that's exactly the that's, time it's like i think that's the same era yeah and i think a lot of 
the theory too is that like it's because of that that Nazis were like they're doing transgender assignment surgery. We need to become yeah. Nazis now. Uh, there was part of it. Yeah, there was a lot of stuff. But I mean, that was a yes. Big there's one. a lot more. Yes, and that's not the reason. I just mean like, that, like we're going to kill every everybody. No, exactly. Uh, it helped. Didn't help, I should say. Um, yeah. But also, Nazis hated uh, different art. They only liked like landscapes and stuff or whatever. Because yeah. yeah, terrible taste. Terrible. I mean, that's what you get with a failed artist who uh, yeah, exactly wants everyone else's art because he can't make his own. Uh, anyway, oh, I drew houses. Me, 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 My professor me, me, me. didn't like it. Oh, I'm gonna go take over or Europe. No, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> That's not art's fault. That's not the professor's fault. Do not blame the art teacher. That is a yet. him problem. <laughs> yeah. That's a Hitler problem. And he needs to uh, recognize that. <laughs> I just kidding. I don't know what I'm talking about. I can't bring up Hitler quite yet, but he's coming. So he's in Berlin. He's painting. And he, he has this exhibit at the Ernst Museum in Budapest while he's still living in Berlin. And this is where he put this painting at this exhibit, mm-hmm. Sleeping Lady with Black Vase. And this was the last time this painting was seen in public until 2009. Oh. And... After the exhibit, it was bought by a private buyer, a private collector, and they think that it was probably a Jewish person because that person quickly left Germany and took the piece with them wherever they went. Okay. And so at the time, if you, Hungary was part of the Axis powers, and I didn't know this, but like they were like fanboys of Hitler to the point where even Germans were like, chill. <laughs> you guys are being crazy. Relax. Yeah. Like, People would be like, yeah, I'll volunteer to, uh, you know, kill a bunch of people. And the Germans were like, okay, all right, let's be. Love the enthusiasm. Orderly let's go ahead and, this. yeah, let's pump the brakes a little bit. I like that energy. Yes. I'm going to need you to hold on to it for a little bit longer <laughs> until we sort this all out. And you guys need to, and then they turn around and go, yeesh, and then Hitler. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's just like, <laughs> caller. So, yeah, Hungary was like super into Nazism. And so, of course, most Jews saw that coming. A lot of them did in Hungary and were like, I'm out of here. And so whoever bought yeah. that painting got out. Anyway, because of this, people began laying low. And whoever this Jewish buyer was skedaddled. So from 1928 skedaddled. until Christmas 2009, this painting was considered lost. Until there was this dude named Gerge Barki. He's a Hungarian yeah. art historian and researcher. And he had just sat down for a Christmas Eve viewing of the wonderful film 1999's Stuart Little, okay, with his three year old, and he's watching, Delightful. and you know, you know, when you're, you know, you don't know, but you're a parent, and you're like, oh, I just got to get through the next three hours. Let's put a movie on, and you're kind of half paying attention, and then suddenly he sees something in the background of one of the scenes. I'm going to send you that a picture right now, okay? Was it in the movie? Oh yeah. So he sees this scene, and and he, some set dresser, Jesus, and he's like, hold up, that looks familiar. <laughs> Because remember, he was he worked for like the uh, like these Hungarian museums and stuff, and he's like, "There's no way." That, hang on, and so he rewind, he rewinds, he watches it over and over again, and he's like, he says, "quote I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw Ber- Berini's long lost masterpiece on the wall behind Hugh Laurie. I nearly dropped Lola from my lap, his daughter." <laughs> And a researcher can never take his eyes off the job, even when watching Christmas movies at home. So he recognized it from a black and white photo he had studied in school or throughout the years doing his job. So he went into like full blown detective mode. He was like, this is Mm -hmm. there's no way this isn't the painting because it was missing in 1928. Why would there be a copy of it? No one even knows this artist outside of Hungary. And now I'm watching an American made film about a, a tiny mouse that gets adopted by a human family and then gets kidnapped. And sitting here at Christmas, and I see this missing painting, and there's a rat, and there's a little mouse. Anyway, I, I, mean, I could not even, even imagine how absurd that is to be like, this stupid movie about a rat? Sorry, a mouse? Also, imagine being kids at the orphanage, and they go and pick out Stuart Little and not you. Imagine. Like, oh, I want, <laughs> Must be hurtful. I want human parents. No, they're going to pick the mouse? Great. Listen, I agree with you conceptually, but if I saw a talking mouse that wore, like, sneakers... <laughs> Sorry, I'm going for the talking mouse with You're sneakers. Adopt I don't care about mouse. some. I don't care about some uh, kids who need to be adopted. I'd be like, this is bigger than you, okay? <laughs> this is bigger than all of us. This is this mouse can talk. This mouse is gonna make me money by becoming an influencer on YouTube. <laughs> and then it's gonna get mad at you and like go to therapy yeah. and then come out and like a, I don't care. I'm just looking for sponsorships. People interview being like, yeah, he never wanted me for me. He wanted me to be exploited. <laughs> Laughing all the way to the bank. I don't care. <laughs> I like that we just unearthed your plan for like 
<laughs> fame through child exploitation? <laughs> no, no, but that's mouse, the thing is that I don't want to exploit children. I want to exploit animals. <gasps> that sounds bad. I should not say that line. <laughs> Cordwainer Smith would be so pissed with me He'd right be now. Like, Excuse Did me? Did you learn nothing from my books? And then he would turn his mice that he trained to murder people with their mind powers on you. <laughs> <laughs> what a cool way to die. Anyway, yeah. so he, so this dude's like mind blown. And he's like, I've got to figure out who was it who found this painting? And so he starts to like call around and email. He sends like fifty emails to Columbia and Sony. Got to find the production designer. Got to figure yeah. out like yeah. He was like, okay, I think I can figure this out. Could not get a hold of anyone. No one answered him for two years. <laughs> classic film. I was gonna say it's, classic is that film. They're classic? on another movie. Oh. They're on another movie. They're like, what do I give a shit about some painting I put up like two years ago? Like. They don't care. They're honestly, they're probably just getting it from a big uh, prop house. Well, I bet you is what it is. You'll, yeah, we'll find out where they trade. They're just pulling from. whatever. Some some poor bastard went in there and took a thousand pictures of different paintings, <laughs> and they sent them to the production designer who showed them to the director. And the director was like, I don't know, I like this one. Just put it in, and then they had to go put it in, and then they they dressed it, and then they got rid of, it, and then they either returned it or sold it. If they had to buy it. This I don't is know, cool. But. Okay, so so if I. <laughs> So it'd be pretty impossible to be like, I want to track down that one prop from this movie from 1995. You could do it. It would be very hard, though. But you'd have to go back and look at like receipts to remember like who. Yeah. And this is 95. That's even older. Yeah, that would be that would not be easy to figure out necessarily. I think you would have to go if you could find the production and then find like the records of that production and their receipts and then see who they had actually no one's getting paid for this, by the way, to look this up. No, and that's like, and also the people yeah. that you're reaching out to to ask and be like, you know, even if you could find like whoever the dresser or the decorator or somebody, it's if they're like, hey, remember when we worked together like ten years ago, like on this one movie, they might be like, you, you and I like hooked up at the rap party, and then they never <laughs> called me again, and I hate you. There's so many things working remember against this guy. Stuart it's unfortunate. Little? Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> well, he uh, he is does not give up. So. Finally, after two years, the set, the, sorry, the, um, you'd know this, set designer. The mouse. The, the, the mouse. Stuart Little calls him and he said, don't talk about that <laughs> painting. Yeah. They get in a fight. He kills the mouse. Uh, it was the, so it was the set designer who finally gets back to him. The actual set designer. Mm-hmm. And she, no one ever talks about her name, but I had to like look it up and I think her name's Connie. So we're going to go with Connie. Um, that's what IMDB said. Connie Betger. And she was like, oh, that old thing? Yeah, uh, we found it at a Pasadena antique shop and thought it might look really good in Stuart Little's living room. Okay. And so she had her assistant set designer, like you said, go buy it uh, for $500, which I was like, Ooh. is that normal? Like somebody must have really liked that or it must have felt really perfect to to spend that much on it. I don't know how. I mean, I, I didn't see the movie, so I don't know what the significance is. Is it just supposed to be like that they're. Um, they're kind of fancy. Is it like a rich family? Yeah. Is that what it is? Is it supposed to be like a piece of art that's like, oh, they're rich and they own like a Picasso or something? Yeah, to kind of give off like a avant garde kind of like. Yeah, here's the thing. It would have cost money to have gotten like a Picasso or something. Yeah. Or you would have had like a whole licensing clearing issue. And then in the case of not doing that, you would have to hire an artist to paint something that was in that style. Oh, so that was like a great find that they were like oh this is so an yeah unknown artist. paying 500 bucks to just buy a piece that nobody that also looks like it's from at least 100 years ago right uh, i guess at that time it wasn't quite 100 years but it probably would have been outside of the not copyright i'm drawing a blank yeah um, yeah uh the thing uh the thing yes um <clears throat> so it would have been fine fair use it would have been fine for fair use they probably couldn't find what oh. it was it was like oh it's just some random artist and it looks like it's from 1920 so it probably would have saved them a lot of hassle and money Okay. I could be wrong. No, no, I'm this is fa- this is why I wanted to do this because I wanted to ask you like yeah. what this process is like. Well, she's like, "Oh yeah, we found it at this like Pasadena antique store." So, they, we bought yeah. it and and he was like, "Okay, so that's an actual painting by a very famous Hungarian artist. Uh, where is it?" And she's like, "Oh, it's hanging in my house." Oh, so nice. So she she held on to it. Held yep. on to it. And it's it was hanging in her house for 10 years after until he called her. Or she finally called him back. Uh, and this was in 2011 that she got back to him. So, yeah, it had been like 11 years, and she decided to take it home, put it in her house, never knew, never had any clue. And Listen, he was. Plenty of people from the art department just walk away with some shit, was... and they were like, this is mine now. <laughs> this is great. Yeah, because she didn't say it like she bought it, but I think she was just like, yeah, I'm taking this. Anyway. If you can. Seal from work. 
And she's like, yeah, so it's, you know, I got it free. <laughs> and he was like, uh, can I come, like, look at it? And she was like, okay, yeah. I kind of don't know who you are. Like, this guy. Yeah, exactly. Like, are you an insane person? Yeah, like, some dude from Hungary who's, like, obsessively like, you finally called me back. You have a famous painting on your wall. Like, stuff like that yeah. where she's like, sure, but we're meeting in public. I'm not meeting you anywhere but, like, a he's park. Literally Indiana Jones. Yes. He's like, this belongs in a museum. Yes. Literally. And he was like, you know, at this point, his daughter is, like, five. And he's been on this for, like, two straight years. And, like, this guy, dude, this guy did his research. He went through all these pathways, couldn't find anybody, contacted, like, the heads of the studio. They're, they're like, secretary. Like, it was, like, this long. And he was in Hungary, so he had to, like, try to figure out how to speak, like, like learn. Who's this Funke we keep hearing about? <laughs> <laughs> um, so he flew from Hungary to Washington D.C., where Connie now okay. lived, and this is my f- possibly my favorite part of the story, besides it being Stuart Little. But they met in a park in public, and you know he's an intense stranger. I would do the same thing, and so she brings this painting, like gets it out of her car and takes it to the park and walks over so with this. This sounds painting. like a CIA handoff it as does. well. They're like, we're gonna sit at this bench in front of the Washington <laughs> Memorial. <laughs> I'm going to place the the painting there. You're not going to say it. Remember like when I did the episode (laughs) about people stealing stuff from Air Force One and they had to return them? It's like that. (laughs) Like down the the way a little bit. Someone's like handing some Air Force One towel to somebody. Yeah. It's just the park they do it at. (laughs) Um, So she brings this painting and she's like, here it is. And he was like, this looks like it, but I can't find a signature anywhere. And she's like, yeah, okay. Well, it's kind of nailed into the frame. And so he's like. Okay, we need to find a hammer or a screwdriver. Oh no. And instead of That's a murder weapon. <laughs> instead of going somewhere like a museum and being like, "Can you help us open this?" He <laughs> He walks over to a nearby hot dog vendor. And he's like, "Do you have a screwdriver?" And he's like, "Actually, I do." And so he <laughs> He borrows a screwdriver from a hot dog vendor, opens up this painting and confirms that yes, this is the actual guy's painting. That's awesome. And she's like, okay, let's get this double checked. Cool. And so yeah. he obviously can't like take it. It's still hers. Yeah. And so she just holds on to it. It's just hers. And But he, he feels like his job has been done. Like, okay, I identified it. At least it's somewhere. It's hanging up. It's safe. And then she decides to sell it in 2014 because why not? And she sold it she for she's sitting on a, bunch a of cash. quarter of a million dollars. Holy shit. Yeah. So- to Stuart Little's family. To, to the the mouse. The mouse came. Yeah. <laughs> Gun. I don't know why I'm thinking of Stuart Little as like a gangster, but like. Why not? I'm going to go. We'll just go with yeah, it. Yeah, he grew fine. up. He's like That's, a crime yeah. in the crime family. He's like giving my Listen, painting. He had, a, he had a tough time at the orphanage. Yeah. You don't know what kind of emotional scars he's got. He turned to a life of crime. Yeah. His rich family didn't understand where he came from. Also, they're human. They certainly. Yeah. They don't understand mice. <laughs> yeah. Classists. Yeah. He wants that painting. Bastards. He does. Anyway, she slaps him out of the way and says, this is my painting, Stuart, Mr. Little. And she sells it for $285,000 to a Hungarian, wow. an anonymous Hungarian art collector. So now it's- Anonymous. No, I know. Now it's just sitting in some Hungarian art collector's collection. And through all of this, I hate, by the way, art, art collectors. Art collectors are the off. worst. Evil. I was like reading about all these different like found paintings and so much of this is just art collectors being dicks like i found out like all the not you know the nazi hitler was like here i want a whole town full of paintings and so they went and stole all the they looted all the paintings and he wanted to make a big museum of it but then like a bunch of like art collectors were just like selling not their neighbors their neighbors jew their jewish neighbors paintings to art collectors to nazi art collectors and it's just like it was it was (laughs) gross like they would come and they'd take them and take them to the ghetto and then like their neighbors would come in and sell their paintings to art collectors like just really gross uh and the fact that this made it out of hungary or out of germany into la to pasadena like (laughs) how did it get in that on antique shop they didn't know anyway so, anyway, it came through Ellis Island. It came through. It's like, oh, I'd like to declare, <laughs> my name is now <laughs> Stuart Little, painting L Hungary. <laughs> oh, so yeah, now I've come away from this from this hating rich art collectors because they are hoarding art and they keep it from the public. As opposed to before that, when you were like totally fine with rich art, I collectors, just didn't sure. know. I didn't think about it, you know. But now it's like, ew, you're keeping ew. that to yourself. Ew. Gross. Like, if I were an artist, I'd be like, get that away from your, you know, get away from that. Anyway, 
So because yeah. of the Stuart Little thing, this is now the most popular and well-known painting from Hungary. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Which is like, great. <laughs> they probably have a bunch of other painters and stuff, but everyone's like, oh, yeah, Hungary has an artist, and he was in Stuart Little. Anyway, so I went on a huge deep dive of all these different lost paintings that, that were found. Nice. And this is going to be a shorter tab because uh, – it was a short story, but uh, an honorable mention is a Van Gogh painting. Van Gogh. Mm-hmm. So you know, remember when he cut his ear off in a psychosis? Yeah, or part of his ear. Part of yeah, part of it, just the lobe or whatever. Well, the doctor that treated him was like, "Hey, dude, here's some medicine or whatever." And and Van Gogh's like, "I'm going to paint a portrait of you." And the doctor's like, "Sure." So his <laughs> name is Doctor, I think Ray. Yeah. I thought he was going to be like, "Listen, I can't super pay you for <laughs> reattaching my ear, but can I pay you in a painting?" His brother paid him. But yeah. I'll draw you a cat portrait. <laughs> please, please help me. Do you have a cat? Uh so Dr. Felix Ray and this so he goes home after, you know, having a mental break and he paints this this portrait of this doctor who helped him with his ear and then he's like, "Here, I painted this." And he was like, "Thanks." And he cool. super did not like the painting. He was like, this oh, no. isn't good. I don't like it. This guy's creepy. And so he like gives it to his wife or mom or something. And that painting hangs out and they start using it <laughs> to block off a chicken coop. <laughs> and that Van Gogh painting was used as like a, a, a cover for a chicken coop for about 30 years oh, before God. it was found. They all hated it. They're like, that hurts. I know. That hurts. I know. <laughs> That's physically painful to hear. And it was like a, a family joke. They're like, oh, that old thing, that thing's hideous. It doesn't even look like him. Like, they all hated it. <laughs> so chicken, chicken poo, feathers, just <laughs> the elephant. What year, did, what year did he become famous? Um, Like, what year did, do you know? I don't actually know what year he became like, because I know obviously he wasn't popular in his time, but like, I'm trying to remember like when he would have become like a name that it was after he recognized. died i'm pretty sure he was he was like no no it was it was definitely after he died oh. i just mean that, like i don't know how long afterwards it was i would guess post-war maybe yeah. well i don't know i actually don't know i'm curious the 30s <laughs> what does the wicker the wikipedia article say rise to fame okay van gogh apparently no no, no you don't have to, it's fine it doesn't matter i know anyway so this chicken coop was being like covered by a van gogh for years and years and the family still was just like i don't care we hate this it's like, get ew. <laughs> Lame. Why wouldn't you just buy a piece of wood? Right. That's well, hey, hey, I'll defend them on this. You use what you got because lazy. Okay, fair. Anyway, yeah. so that was like, it's very. Sh- Sorry, I guess doctors can't afford wood. <laughs> <laughs> on a doctor's salary, you can't afford anything else. Dutch doctors. Uh, I need to send you a picture of Dr. Felix Ray. And I will say this portrait's a little bit creepy looking because he's got shark eyes. But um, cool. just picture chickens pooping and clucking next to this. And for years, hold on. He kind of looks like a he looks like a douchebag. Like Van Gogh really captured his vibe. Oh, yeah. This dude sucks. <laughs> look at him. He's awful. The painting is cool, but yeah. this guy looks like he sucks. He looks like a jerk. He uh, looks like an influencer. He, he, does, he, you know, he looks like he looks like the lead singer of Smash Mouth. R.I.P. Steve Harvey. Yeah. Steve Harvey. Was that no. His name? No, something Harvey. Steve, Steve something? Steve, it was know, Steve whatever. something. Anyway, um, that's my tab about how Stuart Little brought huh, a Hungarian artist to worldwide fame. And I shouldn't say Stuart Little. I should say the guy. Dude, what's his name? The guy, It was Stuart Little. It's okay. We're just going to Oh, Oh, Gergi Barky. Gergi Barky. Barky. Lovely. Yeah. So, Interesting. Little one. Little. But uh, yeah, I went to the whole, I have like so many tabs open of different found paintings, and there's so many cool ones. Like, people would just find one in a thrift store and be like, oh, this is of Matisse. <laughs> Crazy stuff. Jesus. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. Yeah. It makes sense that the output that these people would just have spread around everywhere at some point. Right. <laughs> if they're not super famous during their lifetime, they're not necessarily going to all be curated. No. Anymore. And I give my art to people all the time. I'm just like, I don't want this. I'm not saying I'm no, like Van Gogh. Gross. You littered my house with it. <laughs> <laughs> There's literally you one, one on your wall. Two? Yeah. I gave you two? You gave me two. Okay, whatever. You gave me the the Mothman one. Oh, that's the right, one that's the right, the original. How to be an artist, where like they have doubt and then repeat. Yeah, great. Um, anyway, cool. Yeah. Thank you for that tab. That was interesting. I like hearing about Stuart Little's black market <laughs> Pasadena thrift store find. <laughs> also, it goes to show you that Stuart Little's family not actually rich. No, they were lying. They were. They were trying to keep up with the Joneses. <laughs> uh 
Okay, let's move on to closing our tabs. Uh, what did you say you wanted for the sound earlier? I don't I know. I was saying you made a weird space alien noise, and I was like, oh, let's right. do like, that. Brrr, yeah. brrr, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> so we're going to do a bunch of control panel noises to shut down our oh, tabs. Oh, and then a psychic beam exploding <laughs> something. Like, oh. oh. Wait, the sound of mink, and then uh, like one of yeah. those like energy beam sounds. <laughs> yeah. All right, you want to count us down? Sorry, Alyssa. Yeah, ready? Uh, yeah. Three, two... One, close, boom. Goodbye. Yeah, I'm. All right, I'm moving done on at that to mouse. listener emails. Yeah. Our first email is from Alex from Durham, North Carolina. Okay. Hey there, I am Alex, and my wife is a huge fan. Oh. Wow, Alex. I guess you're cool. not a fan, but thank you for writing anyway. Hmm. Uh, my open tab is about <laughs> Ball des Ardents, Ooh. or the Ball of the Burning Men. Oh! In the late 14th century, at the height of the Hundred Years' War, France was ruled by Charles VI, who was rendered incapable of kingships for long periods of time <laughs> due to a variety of what he could identify as severe mental illness. Like, like psychos, like crazy. He was straight up crazy. Yeah. During one of his bouts of incapacity, members of the court decided that the true root of his violent paranoia, disassociative episodes, and delusions of being made of glass right. was a severe lack of merriment and gaiety. Oh, yeah. Just be happy. Just smile. He just needed a weekend. He just needs to smile more. <laughs> if you think Wait, about hey, happy hey, things. Hey, sweetheart, what are you scoffing about? Why don't you put a smile on that face? <laughs> Basically, his 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 court doctors were a bunch of construction workers yeah, like yelling at the king calling. as he was walking by. Nice glass yeah. body. Woo! He really did. Though. He was like, I have to be carried everywhere, and I could not. I can like tiptoe because he thinks he's made of glass. And everyone's like, We're I mean, in the depths of war. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to handle this. That sounds like most people on social media. I'd be like, I had to wake up from a nap. Can someone carry me? I have to make a phone call to my doctor. I need to be carried around because I'm made of glass. Anyway, to lift the spirits of their king, nobles began to throw sumptuous balls in his honor by levying yet more crushing taxes on the peasantry. (laughs) One such mirthful ball, a masquerade thrown on January 28th, 1393, was held to celebrate the remarriage of one of the queen's ladies in waiting. The king, along with five companions from the court, emerged, masked and disguised as, quote, wild men, in flaxen costumes, and began to perform a dance, oh. mocking the newly remarried woman. Oh, oh. And because high, because flax is highly flammable, oh, no. torches were banned from the dance. But as chance would have it, uh-huh. one of the king's brothers, the Duke of Orleans, barged in, <laughs> drunk, and with an entourage of torch-wielding knights. <laughs> Within seconds, the flaxen outfits caught fire and the room was filled with the smell of roasting French noblemen. Of the six wild men, only two survived, a noble who had the good fortune to leap into a vat of wine, and the king himself, who was shielded from the sparks by the voluminous skirt of a nearby duchess. Whoa! The Ball des Ardents would have massive ramifications for the French crown for decades to come and would even cause a civil war. What? The fallout cemented the perception of the French court as decadent and depraved, and the story itself is so gothic that it inspired Edgar Allan Poe's Hop Frog. Oh, my gosh. And then Alex includes a, includes a link. Uh, that's insane. I, uh, I could just picture that. Some, like, psychotic king catching on fire. Wow. You don't have to picture it. It's there. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. And uh, hopefully you will also be a huge fan now. Yeah. Just like your wife. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Uh, Anyway, you're up. Cool. Okay, email number two. Tessa from Ohio says, I just started listening to this podcast and it is dangerous. It's actually Uh-oh. it's actually making me open more tabs than closing. Yeah. That's, that's the whole point. We didn't think it would be the point, but it turned out to be the point. So <laughs> That's uh, true. That was not the point originally. No. I don't know why I said that. Uh, after listening to Alligator Joe Camel, I had to learn even more about camels. I came across the Wikipedia. Hell yeah. Yeah. Yes. I came across the Wikipedia camels. entry about wild Bactrian camels and earned oh. some nightmare fuel. See attached nice. picture. So if you go to the the doc, yeah. uh, tell me, why oh. does that thing look like it knows exactly how and when you will die? And so <laughs> <laughs> look at it. What's with its humps? They're like pointy mountains. It does look, yeah, it's really weird. It's I don't like it. Oh, so its face looks like that meme of the dude with the backwards hat who's like, <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> Where he's like holding the the cup. Yep. You know what I'm talking oh, about? Oh yeah. 
<laughs> I don't know what that reaction's called. Uh, I like this. Cam- it just looks like this person was driving and they stopped and this insane, psychotic looking camel just walked up to the car. So they are wild. I went and read about them some more because I was like, well, there are the wild Bactrian camels. Are there non-wild ones? And for sure there are. If you look at the picture I put in below. Yeah. That thing looks like a fancy cake. That thing looks like an ottoman. That <laughs> was like like a weird couch. Yeah. Because the, it's, but that has to just do with its haircut. Yeah. Or they, lack thereof they, properly. Like they stopped halfway through it. That, that So there's like the ones that they domesticated that are all fancy and fluffy. And then there's these wild yeah. ones that Tessa sent in that just look like they're going to kill you. <laughs> Anyway, back to Tessa. I digress. The tab that started this all was the Wikipedia entry for a list of heritage railroads across the U.S. Side note. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was like, trains and camels. Trains! And <laughs> is that from something or did you just say trains? I just said, trains! <laughs> trains! <laughs> so, trains! It's like a Muppet. Captain Wow! <laughs> I am a Muppet. We've I discussed know, this. I know. I know. Side note. My- yeah! <laughs> That's pretty good. Thank you. Uh, I've practiced. I can tell. Sorry. Trains. Go on. Continue. Trains. Uh, side note. My girlfriend has told me explicitly that I cannot hyperfixate on trains. I am already doing that with lighthouses and she can only handle so much. <laughs> can't, can't say I blame her. She says, I didn't say that. Uh, so, of course, I learn little tidbits about them and present these choice nuggets of wisdom to her at random intervals to piss her off. No, I do not know what qualifies as railroad. a railroad as a heritage railroad, because some of them are theme park railroads, which seems to make sense most because the train cars were in service prior to the opening of these theme parks, Disneyland, uh. Cedar Point. But then why is the Disney World Animal Kingdom train included when it has brand new train cars and is a newer line? Again, I digress. Apparently, Disney World has specific train tours where you can see where the trains go to sleep. At the end of this That's exclusive awesome. tour, you earn an exclusive prize, a railroad spike. That <gasps> is, until 9-11. What? I could never have pred- predicted this. Damn it. Just a, 9-11 ruining everything again. Just another thing 9-11 took from us. Now they give you exactly. exclusive lapel pins. Lame. I want an exclusive prize that could set TSA into a tailspin. <laughs> Anyways, love the podcast. Just finished skydiving beavers. Can't wait to continue listening. Tessa. Thank you, Tessa. Thank you, Tessa. Listen, last I checked, the hi- this, the hijackers were not using like railroad right. spikes. They used box cutters, all right? Yeah, which I accidentally what? got on a plane with the last time I flew. It's not Classic. even checking. Classic white lady. Uh, I accidentally yeah. got on there with a <laughs> box true. cutter. I know. That that, yeah. that right there just really showed me, showed uh, our difference yeah. at the airport. Like they were like, yeah, yes. sure, you have a knife, go through. And they're like, hang yeah. on, you look slightly on. not white. You trying to go in with nothing in your, like, with no bag? <laughs> Get in the room. Yeah. Jeez. Uh, anyway, anyway. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, Tessa and Alex. If you have a tab of your own that you'd like to share with us, please go ahead and send it to 500opentabs at gmail.com. That's 500. Let us know a fun fact that you learn. Keep it brief. Okay. Uh, include the link and let us know where you're from because we like knowing where we have friends. Additionally, we are still doing the voice recordings. Uh, if you'd like to do those, those are fun to play on the air as well. Yeah, so they just are. keep it to about a minute. Uh, I think in the past people have written out the email that they wanted to send and then just read that if you're worried about it uh-huh. sounding <clears throat> weird about having to talk. So that's another way to do it. But also send that to 500 open times at gmail.com. And if you're going to be near New York City uh, in October, we will be at New York City Comic Con tabling together. Uh, yeah. Artist Alley. Artist Alley. Still don't have the booth number, but I can get that posted. Um, and yeah, we got come get some personalized drawings we're doing and, and you know, mm-hmm. talk about the podcast. I don't know. You know us. We'll podcast. talk about whatever. Um, talk about whatever. You've got a book coming out. I'll have book, my yeah. books. He's got multiple Ooh, books, be a lot of books that have come yeah. out. Yeah. Uh, We've got a lot of books, a lot of drawings, a lot yeah. of prints, a lot of stickers, a lot of everything. Yeah, this this is going to be some fun. You've got a bunch of new stuff that you're debuting. I got some this. new stuff I'm working on. Yeah, that's going to be fun. But I'm that personally I for very excited. <laughs> yeah, if I can pull it off. Uh, well, we'll see. Yeah, you can. Yeah. No pressure. Yes, no I pressure. will. It'll be fine. Uh, and then we also have a bunch of exclusive stuff on Patreon, like an AMA and, and extra clips and stuff. Yeah, go sign up for the Patreon. Subscribe to the YouTube, please. 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 If someone recommended this podcast to you, please go ahead and recommend it to somebody else. Yeah. Word of mouth seems to be the only way. Mm-hmm. I shouldn't say the only way, but the best the way. The best way, yeah. I, f- I don't think I've ever 
gotten up uh, gotten into a podcast because I saw some advertisement no. about it. I think it's only been because someone told yep. me. So we really need your guys' help yeah. in spreading the word to get um, more and more people to subscribe so we can hopefully make this a better <clears throat> endeavor that uh, allows us to do it as a proper job. And instead of I would love whatever the hell this yeah. is right now. I would love a fun hobby. Sadly, I don't know if it's fun and I don't know if it's a hobby. I'm kidding. Look, I know Both you can't things. stand me. Yeah. Awful, awful. We gotta go to podcast therapy. I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> just to be clear, we're totally kidding. That it's actually the complete opposite, opposite. of that. I'm like, like, people are gonna be like, oh, oh they no, said no. It. All like, we no. do is talk to each other. Like, it's true. If we didn't do this podcast, this would still be what we're doing. Anyway, so it's true. Uh, you can follow me at Hannah Hillam. Uh, what about you? Uh, you can follow me at Perma Friends on Instagram, uh, and of course at 500 Open Tabs is where yes. we are on Instagram and. Uh, Twitter that we've never gone. Um, anyway, join the Discord. Follow the links. Yeah. All the stuff's in the notes. Thanks, Alyssa. Um, thank you, Alyssa. And I think that pretty much means that Segundus Nixon shot here, shat here five times, right? I think right? he did, yeah. Up, just Do down the wall, five times. Down the wall. Do we want to keep doing Segundus Nixon shat here five times? I mean, I still think it's funny, but I feel we like keep I'm doing it. ignoring our roots. Look, our Josie this roots. show is all about not doing norm- like anything. Uh, that's true like we could do whatever we want that's plus true. we, we had the Josie's want. on and so now it's like maybe that chapter's that was the culm- you think closed? that's like the culmination of the keeping a Josie I don't know it felt like it okay we'll see we'll see it, let us know keep it Josie <laughs> keep it let us know in the comments keep it Nixon no just kidding keep it Ni- uh, keep it Segundus <laughs> I'll see you at the shitting wall <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you at the shitting wall y'all <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha